A force within the Adra tugs at your soul from your body into a realm of pure essence. You become aware of a fragmented, dreamlike landscape. It is not a physical place, but rather a shape your mind has formed from the teeming energy. So is your presence in it. I got an itch. Can someone scratch my elbow? I lift it with my body. Hello and welcome everybody to session 11 of my Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire lore through. We are currently in the third level of the Ngwithin Way Station on Pogo Kaharo. There is a large piece of corrupted Adra in here and we've been seeing some murals on the walls of Juana and Ngwithins. And it seems like there might have been some kind of sacrifice of Juana here. Uh, and Gwithin's using them for some kind of purpose, not exactly sure what. So we, as we descend below, hopefully we learn a little bit more about the mysteries of the Corrupted Adra and the Huana relationship with the Anguithans. Before we get started today, though, uh, I wanted to read from the guidebook. This is from the history section. We didn't do this last time because there were some bestiary entries I wanted to go over, but uh, I think we're all caught up with bestiary, so uh, we are going to be reading today uh, about the Royal Deadfire Company pushing into the Deadfire. So this takes place in 2758 AI, so it's about 70 years ago at this point. With trading routes becoming increasingly profitable on the treacherous frontier, Rawatai scrambled to catch up to the Republic's steep advantage. Rawatai is the nation of Rawatai, and the Republic here would be the Valian Republic. Rawatai's emperor, the Ranganui, turned his focus to the islands themselves and the soil which was ripe for tilling and cultivation. Rawatai's lands were largely infertile and foreign trading deals supplied much of the country's provisions, making the breadbasket of the Deadfire all the more appealing as a prospect for the future of Rawatai's growing empire. Among their more immediate needs, Rawatai also sought easily accessible timber to supply their shipwrights with materials to maintain their naval strength. Some of the more unusual weather activity caught the Ranganui's attention as well, and the storms about Andra's mortar being especially significant. He and his weather seers sought to understand what made the dead fire so remarkable that such furious storms could persist uninterrupted. One of the many speculative conclusions suggested that the dead fire's abundance of luminous Adra contributed to the anomaly, though none could guess how. Until they could understand more, all that stood in the Ranganui's path was the uphill battle of competing against the Valian Republics. Their trading company had already formed an unbreakable monopoly around the worldwide merchant routes, and he did not want a repeat of, his, of this to occur in the dead fire while he could stop it. The Ranganui gathered the strength of his country's naval fleet as the raw material to form and empower the Red Royal Deadfire Company. Under their imperial charter, the company sailed east, driven by their new mission to take control of the dead fire before it could slip from their grasp forever. This move grew great, great praise from the Rawatai public, wayfaring and conquest being prominent in their cultural heritage, and attracted many to enlist for the glory of their country. A mixture of propaganda and homegrown pride meant that everyone wanted to do their part for the good of Rawatai. In their eagerness to grab unclaimed land in the name of the homeland, the trading company ran afoul of the archipelago's less welcoming residents. Deadfire creatures who bristled at the military incursion, chiefly the snake-like Naga, organized in defense of their ancestral environment. The Royal Deadfire Company found themselves outnumbered by Trixum and strategic foes, though never outclassed. Rawatayan weapons were second to none, and the Ranganui demanded that no warship go without cannons, hoping that intimidation alone could win a portion of the battles ahead of them. Kith's strategy did not interest the Naga, and cannons were of little concern when the creatures could slither by the hundreds onto the decks. In spite of their enthusiasm, Naga archers and swordsmen stood little chance against the rifles of Rawatai's armory. Regular conflicts between the mismatched foes culminated in the loss of life on both sides in addition to enmity that persisted across the entire campaign. As they gradually fell, before the superior might and strategy of the Rawataians, tribes of Naga were forced from the Ar-Island caves, burrows, and ancient temples. From distant retreats, the intelligent creatures of the Deadfire cursed all foreigners. Their mastery of black powder and the Juana who failed to protect the archipelago. News of this incursion spread slowly among the Juana tribes, their hands already full with the burden of Valian diplomacy. Once the central authority of the tribes recognized the threat at their doorstep, the most decisive day of conflict came when the Wahiki tribe rose up against the Royal Deadfire Company. In the aftermath of a bloody naval battle, see the Battle of Nakaro Atoll, 
I'll have to remember to read that at some point. I, maybe I did read that. Uh, Rawatai dominated the seas, and the once proud tribe lay decimated. The Huana were not without the power to fight back, and reprisal was nigh. I think maybe I did read about that battle there. Uh, so here we learn that the Royal Deadfire Company and Rawatai in general wanted to have a foothold in the Deadfire Archipelago for resources. Um, especially since Rawatai, it said, was infertile, so they need places where they can get food from, basically. Also here, it suggests that the Naga, who we have not met yet in this game, they're a snake-like race, um, but they had a... I, I don't know if it was a friendly relationship with the Huana, or at least it was a peaceful relationship with the Huana. They were able to exist together. And when Rawatai started moving into the Deadfire Archipelago, then they started to also decimate some of the Naga tribes. And the Huana actually took offense to this. And the Wahiki tribe in particular took offense to this. Uh, but they were also kind of destroyed. And I mean, I don't want to say 100% destroyed, uh, but they were defeated anyway by the Royal Deadfire Company. So because of Rawatai's might in military, they were able to take control of some of the Deadfire Archipelago with the Royal Deadfire Company. Um, and I think that's everything I wanted to say about history today. Uh, as we see here, uh, Shodi wants to talk to us, so I guess we'll start with that, and then we will uh, continue our exploration of the Ingwithin Way Station. So let's see what Shodi has to say. Shodi sways on her feet, a soft low moan easing from her throat. She rubs a thumb over worry-bitten lips. You feeling okay? Sweat trickles a line from her temple to the drip of her chin. Her eyes are hazy, far off. Um, this is her related to her personal quest. We just saw the Lantern of Gone up there. Watcher. Slowly, she swallows, throat working to bring her voice back, or to keep her meal down. It's nothing but a wake in terror. Soon to pass. She shudders hard, coming back to herself. You may want to aim away from our watcher there if it's gonna pass out of your mouth. <clears throat> Sorry, I know you're going through something there. Uh, you could call it something, all right. She tilts her head, brow pinched, as if she can't tell if he's poking fun at her or not. Want to talk about it? Now there's no need for that. Unless... She juts her chin to the right. You see those shambling corpses too? Oh, I actually don't. At her hastily whispered words, the hair on your back, the hair on the back of your neck stands on end. You glance around, just to be safe, but there's nothing to be seen. Nothing unusual anyway, even in the direction Shodi's staring, affixed. What do you see? I see a body of stitched together parts and flayed flesh. It's got three heads and four stretched limbs. On each of its heads curves three white horns from above three blind eyes. Seems like some kind of nightmarish flesh construct. The beast is big as a mountain and shambling toward us beneath the sun turned black as slow. Her eyes roll skyward, and she teeters on her heels as if she's riding on the cusp of a seizure. The lantern rattles in her grip. She exhales a sigh. I know it ain't really there. Lately, it's been getting worse. Some nights I wake sweaty and shaken. Other times, I'm already awake. I got my eyes wide open, staring down the darkness, watching one lantern after another flickering out. And every soul looks so ripe, darn near rotten with a need for reaping. What does that mean? Dark days are coming for Kithkind. When the last light of hell burns out, the final harvest will be upon us. I think... I think we might all die out. A deep line crinkles between her brows. 
She's talking about the extinction of all kith? But does Gon want me to stop it? Or to help? We can relight the lanterns, lanterns of hell, given enough time. All is not lost. Hell here, um, it's just a term for the beyond. It's not like the hell we have on Earth where like the evil souls go there. It's just a place that souls go in Aora. I sure hope you're right, Watcher. Because if you're wrong... Nervously, she jiggles her lantern, eyes lost in its flames. No. I know you're right. Gon's chosen me. So until I figure out what's needed of me, I'll do my darndest to help you on your path. She lifts her gaze to your face. We'll figure this out together. Shoulders squared, she looks off into the distance. Is there anything we can do to alleviate your nightmares? I'm carrying more souls than I've ever shepherded before. So, I don't know that it'll work this time, but used to be. When the dreams were riding me hard, I'd cleanse my soul before gone. If we stop by the temple in Nekataka, I can perform the ritual. Please, I need the relief. It won't take more than a minute under Gon's statue, that's all. Alright, so, I'm gonna guess these additions to the journal say something about, yeah. Perform a spiritual cleansing in the Temple of Gon. Shodi struggles with the increasing burden of many souls she's harvested for her god. She'd like to try a cleansing ritual before the carved statue in the Temple of Gon. She's hopeful it may lighten her darkened, darkening mental state. Uh, so I'll have to remember to head there. Um, as I unpause here, I'm noticing there's some kind of electrical current that's going through these uh, copper reliefs in the ground. I'd be glad to. I want everybody moving. All right, here goes. Obsidian flakes. These are essence batteries. For those. It's nearly destroyed already. Damaged. Nearly destroyed. This is testing my limits. I must rest. Pelagene has bit the big one! <laughs> I didn't realize that electrical current was hurting us. <laughs> Alright, let's try that again. Alright, we are back. Quick saved. Gotta sneak along this, so maybe I should change my formation here to a single line. At once. Why are we standing like that still? Okay, let's see. Maybe if we destroy these batteries, these will stop. No. Alright. How are we going to do this here? Let's get someone with a gun. Uh. Okay, yeah, so seems like doing that <laughs> stops the electrical current. Fun. 
So I've got some things, but there's nothing coming from. All right, so there's little spouts on the ground here that the electrical current must have been starting from because you can still see some sparks coming out of them. Yet another mystery of this place. There's a lot of mysteries in Gwythin Ruins. I guess par for the course for ancient civilizations, ancient long dead civilizations. Got another mural here. The Juana's figure, figure sacrifice seems to have supplied the pillar with energy, depicted in blue flame. So yeah, we saw in the second, I believe, floor, those like pods that it looked like a body would go in. And there was a, I, I think it was uh, these copper reliefs that were in the ground that was flowing to like a central chamber. And these sacrifices would somehow power um, these whatever was in the center there. Indeed. Oh, that looks like where the Luminous Adra is. So let's go this other way first. Good choice. Dead soul here. A woman lies dead in the tiles, her skin discolored with decay. Her rent flesh sloughs away to reveal bone. No maggots or bo bugs have reached her here, which only means that there's more of her left to assault your nostrils. A sword lies discarded beside her, a pack lies beneath her arm, and the barest whip of essence hovers over her body. Examine the body. The woman's body lies at the end of the trail of smeared, crusted blood. The damage to her armor suggests a fight, Though it looks like her attacker, or attackers, allowed her to crawl away to die. Holding your breath, you kneel to search the body. As you handle her remains, clumps of muscle and flesh fall off, raising a fresh wave of rot. Most of her belongings are slimy and rancid with putrescence, but her pack has escaped the worst of it. Inside you see a few torn pages and a carved figurine. Let's read her soul first. The brief images you see are scattered and confused. You are an explorer with the Valian Trading Company, and you are searching the ruins with your comrades. At least, they used to be your comrades. Now, you're not so sure. Um, just as a reminder, throughout the outside of the ruins and then into the ruins, we've been seeing visions of people who were fighting amongst themselves. Uh, we saw corrupted Adra and the second floor, and it seems like somehow the corrupted Adra is corrupting souls of people who are here and forcing them to fight amongst themselves. And this woman obviously seems like a uh, casualty of that infighting. Things have been going wrong ever since you got to this island. First with Gion, then Alara. Though it might have started earlier on Tikawara, maybe when Vector fell sick. You hear a scream in the distance. You don't know where the others are. You don't know why there's blood in your hands. You don't know why it's so hard to think. But you remember that you are supposed to be quiet to avoid the notice of whatever is down here. Something moves in the darkness. Hmm. I'm going to make sure to read that journal entry here. Let's take the pages. They look like they were ripped from a book or journal. They're brown and warped with spilled drink and scrawled with a few brief entries. This is Beza's pages. These pages have been torn out of a larger book. They're stained brown and stiff with some dark, fragrant li liquid. The entry begins thus. I wanted so badly to find Pogokahara, and now we are stuck here. No one dares to leave while the Titan roams outside, so we must hope we can find another exit somewhere in the ruins. Alara must have triggered it, and it did not move until she began prying open the door, and before we knew it, it had Gion. The others do not say it, but I know they blame me for failing to save him. Uh, so I guess they were able to get into here without fighting the Titan. Uh, one of them was killed by the Titan, but they ran in uh, while it was still on the prowl. Smudges of dirt from the author's hand streak the page around the next entry. Alara is gone, too. We move more slowly now, wary of traps and monsters. I detest this creeping about, and Dueno stomping nearly makes it all pointless. But Falero has almost lost his nerve, and I do not think he can take another nasty surprise. The next entry is filled with big crooked letters that loop and swoop like a child's. The others sleep. We decided against candles or campfires, so I write in the glow of the Audra. It is good, because I hear something moving in the dark, even if the others do not. Falero insisted that we move slowly so he could study the murals and the patterns in the floor. He thinks to save us from mishaps like the ones that befell Gion in Alara, but none of that will help if the creatures here catch us. 
Dueno hides a lamp, but the way he looks at Falero and makes me think he's hiding something too. They grow more and more paranoid with every hour in this place. When they awaken, we will press forward so that we may be done with it. In the meantime, I will keep the pages with my own observations. I cannot trust the others with them. The next entry is hastily scribbled. Falero lost the logbook and accuses me of sabotage. Sabotage! He is so busy sketching these murals that he forgets why we are here. But I saw the Adra, and I understood. This place is sick. We are here to cure it. But Falero says the Huana were here long ago, that the murals prove as much. I think one Aumawa looks much like another, but he gave me an idea. Right now we spend blood and treasure searching for luminous Adra. Our task would be much easier if we could make regular Adra luminous by enriching it with live souls. As I look at the equipment with the Ingwithans built here, so like the machines of our Animancer's construct, I wonder, construct, I wonder if they once did this very thing. And we have the villagers of Tikawara so eager to help. When we return to Nekataka, I will present my idea to Lueva Alvari. I do not think Director Costol has the stomach for it nor my companions, I fear, suggesting she wants to bring the residents of Tikuara here and sacrifice these lives to make luminous Adra. So the suggestion here is that Adra isn't created luminous. Well, no, that's not the right word. That Adra isn't formed luminous, but is later created by the infusion of live souls. Um, and I guess then when Adra loses its luminosity, I don't know what the word would be there, um, that would be because Aethys is taking these souls from it. Um, okay. Take the figurine. The wooden figurine has the body of a woman and the head of a fish with beady eyes and a gaping snaggletoothed maw. It's pale rough textured like it was carved recently. This is the Ngati idol. This figurine is carved in the shape of a woman with the head of an anglerfish. Okay. But as you study the piece, you get a sudden image of a woman, a priestess, carving it by candlelight, muttering furious frantic curses. Sure enough, a confusion hex is carved at the bottoms of the feet. This is my cipher ability allowing me to do this. You feel a sudden sharp headache. Oh, take her weapon. The saber boasts viciously serrated edge. Despite the state of its former master, the blade appeared to be in good condition, and you retrieve it. This is Baze's toothed blade. Adair is proficient with saber, so I'll give this to him. It's an exceptional weapon. Has biting cuts, minus one armor rating for ten seconds on a critical hit. Baze was a senior member of the Collegia de Dinfins... I'm sorry. De Fincha Mutio a prestigious Valian dueling society. The club's standard duel for membership for members of equal standing was single blade against single blade, fought until first blood was drawn. The duelists wore leather armor, padded doublets, and masks, enough to prevent a minor strike from becoming a lethal blow. Beza had a blade constructed that proved extremely effective at biting su through such protection. Her fellow duelists came to fear her in her jagged saber. All right, leave. thought maybe I would have some kind of um, status effect from the idol, but not seeing anything. Hmm. Yep, definitely going to give this to Adair. Does it already have? Okay, so I could either give it rending cuts, which is better than the biting cuts, so it would be minus two armor rating for 10 seconds, or I could give it first blood, which it keeps that biting cuts, and it gets plus 10 action speed for 10 seconds on scoring a hit against targets with more than three quarters of their help. Oh, but I don't have enough materials for that. I need reptilian blood. And I think that's the one I want to do. I could do rending cuts, but I think I, I would rather do the other one. So I'll leave it alone for now. It's already an exceptional sword, so it's pretty good. On the efficacy of imps, I believe we've read that already. Have we read this? And I kept a list of things, books that I checked off for the first game. 
I have not been doing that for the second game. I thought I'd be able to remember. Big mistake. I will uh, hold on to that and see if we have to read it at some point. Some kind of shaking quake. The stone and glass of this contraption vibrates with some internal energy, setting the copper rings to buzzing. Got cave coral and gunpowder. Wow. Man, the red is so much more apparent now. Don't plan on connecting with this pillar. That is striking looking. Energy pulses through the twisted column like an irregular heartbeat, straining at the bounding walls. This looks like an exit over here. I don't want to touch that yet. Alright, let's see what happens here. The machine at the base of the pillar is in bad shape. The Audra panels are warped and the copper is corroded, but it looks whole. A high keening sound comes from the Audra. Examine the machine. You check the copper connections and knobs. Everything appears to be intact, but none of the essence in the pillar runs through it. The keening grows louder activate the machine uh before i do this here the, the royal dead fire company wanted us to uh kind of deactivate this luminous audra here to take away this pillar from the valian trading company and i was worried about what would happen if we do this but now that we see how corrupted it is it definitely seems like it's the right decision to make um not because it's what the royal dead fire company wants but because it's so obviously corrupted and damaging people that are around it you turn the Audra wheel and adjust some of the sliders. At first, nothing happens. Then you feel a fluctuation in the ether. The wailing grows louder. Whoa. Essence moves within the Audra, opening a dimension as raw and distorted as a fresh wound. Something in that place pulls at your soul and the distant voices cry out again. Enter the corrupted Audra. Whatever's corrupting the Audra is embedded deep within it. I feel a presence coming from within the pillar. I may be able to reach the source of the corruption by projecting my soul into it. Um, I said I wanted to read. A journal entry, and I said I needed to not forget. And then I forgot. Good job. I think it was this one here, where it just says, I found the heart of the corruption. There's a machine here. Perhaps that will help me clear it. All right. The dimension within the Audra is open, tugging at your soul. Project your party into the pillar. A force within the Adra tugs your soul from your body into a realm of pure essence. You become aware of a fragmented, dreamlike landscape. It is not a physical place, but rather a shape your mind has formed from the teeming energy. So is your presence in it. I got an itch. Can someone scratch my elbow? I lift it with my body. Your actual body is still in Pogokohara. You feel the cold tiles beneath it and smell the dusty air around it, but you cannot return to it. Something here has a hold on you. The voices you heard outside the pillar scream and wail somewhere close by. Wow. Oh, Jesus. Some kind of... fleshy mass. You see arms sticking out. Oof. I swear I've played this game before. I know I've seen this before, but I just forgot it. 
That is uh, quite the sight there. Um, I felt like I was going to do something. I don't remember what it was. Okay. Oh, I want to see this. This is called the Audra Realm. Pretty small map. And everything here is essence. I guess these are the Valian explorers who were in the ruins the, that the corrupted Adra got a hold of. Um, this looks like it would be Beza. I, d I don't remember all the other names, but Beza is the last one we got the sword from. You reach the source of the tumult, a festering mass of corruption. Hundreds of souls cry out within it, trapped and twisted by the accumulating decay. I do hope that isn't contagious. A handful of souls, still fresh and mostly whole, surface to confront you. One of them separates out from the others and stares you down with grim, hateful intensity. You do not belong here. That looks Almawa. So are these Valians and Huana? The speaker takes the form of an older Huana man, his visage shifting as if reflected in rippling water. He's not a physical presence, but rather a soul given shape. Biarter, captain of the Defiant, at your service. We are the dead. His voice hits in your mind like a clapper to a bell. We're talking to a lost soul? Hold on, before you say any more, look into the light of my lantern. Eager, she raises the lantern high, shaking it back and forth to scatter the light around in skittering dance. He bares his teeth at her and squints as a trickle of essence leaves his body. When he looks away... The trickle stops. Maybe you're dead. I do not see Tangaloa's mouth or Sirono's doors anywhere. A second form takes shape near the first and glowers at him. Their essence sharpen and flicker at each other. Sirono, a valian variant of Bareth, god of death cycles and doors. So she actually used Tangaloa, which is the Huana version of Bareth, and Sirono, which I guess is the valian version of Bareth. My storm reads Pococahara. Ngati's fist drags Valian ships to the deep. If you come to stop this, you have already failed. His form gathers definition. Whether or not his words are true, he believes what he's saying. You're responsible for the storms? How? Ngati holds our souls in this swamp, cut off from the sea. The flow of essence stops here. He gazes out at the shifting scenery beyond your floating platform of what only resembles stone. And rots, apparently. She wrinkles her nose at the putrefying mass and checks under her boots. What do you mean, rots? Souls are going bad cut off from the cycle? My lantern looks fine and healthy, though. Uh, what did she say? Ngati holds our souls in the swamp, cut off from the sea. The flow of the essence stops here, and rots, apparently. So the storm... is holding the souls here? And then rotting it, so it's like they're going... the souls are going bad? I don't claim to understand it, girl. I am a miner, not a mystic. She aims a hard glare at Anaharu. The cistern overflows into the world of the living, stirring the sea and skies with the fury of the goddess, bringing storms. Should I be honest? There's nothing divine about broken machinery around an Audra pillar. The gods laugh at machines, I say. Nothing built of kith hands can rest away their will. In spite of his words, he regards the corruption over his shoulder with a frown. No souls travel through here. The Adra screams. Ngati grins, showing her fangs.
No souls travel through here. This is where Valiant's scheming ends. Ngati's servant holds the dam closed to flood the living world with her vengeance. He places a hand over the spot his heart once occupied. Pushing out Valia only exchanges a trading post for Rao Italian warships. Eh, uh, that seems like I would be siding with Valia. So the first option is you think destroying the region will save Tikawara? So these are Tikawaran souls. Is that, is Anaharu, is that the guy who disappeared from Tikawara? Like these storms are reaching Tikawara and those are the souls that are here. And then there's the Valians here as well, the Valian Trading Company. Show him Baze's pages. You sure? They'll do anything to protect an investment. Though you're only holding a mental projection of the pages, Anaharo peers down at them and absorbs their meeting. He turns his gaze toward Beza. Don't look at me. You report to your fish goddess and I report to Sangreta Mia Compressa. Anaharo silences her with a glare. I am the storm of my people. Adra is the staff I wave to churn Ngati's kingdom. He opens his palms. The ether around you reacts at once, whipping up the ambient essence into frenzy. Far away, you think you can hear furious winds growing in response. Compensating, are we? <laughs> you will not laugh when I scatter your soul to the breeze. Madiko. To arrive at the far side of death and find this babbling brook. She presses her temples with both hands. The Valians will not overrun us while I have the strength to repel them. He furrows his brow toward Beza. If you think bad weather will hold back my countrymen, you have greatly underestimated us. They will depart when the waters rise to drown their investments. This I know. These storms chase away fish and blight crops. You're the one killing Tikawara. Fool! Ngati will stop churning the seas when the outsiders leave. Then I will be reborn as a Ranga. Pirates and slavers drove my tribe from our old roots and havens. Now, the Valians do the same with paper. They come to pull Adra from the earth and mill it like grain. You speak as though this Adra has been the heart and soul of your tribe for generations. Though you have only recently come here. Algina's always got the Valian trading company's interests at heart. Adra is the heart and health of the dead fire. You whose breast is cold and still would know nothing of this. There is nothing more to say. Here at the end, outsider lies are a dull edge. He glowers at you, the ambient essence growing sharp and turbulent around him. You've all died. Maybe I can help you move on. This is where all things stop. No one leaves, I say. He balls his hands into fists, his shoulders nodding with tension. Akosi, let's not be hasty. Some of us still have bodies out there. She puts a hand in protest and glances to the souls of her crew. You don't plan on staying here, right? Why not let us tag along and see if we can reunite with our... What we left behind. It never ends well when you stuff mismatched essence into one body. You're not lying, are you? She glances back toward her crew and winces. You've all served your captain with distinction. But I think this is where we part ways. She nods to each of them in turn. 
Dismiss. She salutes her crew, many of whom vanish on the spot, their souls joining ambient ether. Beza nods to you and departs soon after, grimacing on a Haru advances. So, I wonder if we would have had to fight those few souls who disappeared if we didn't do that conversation that way. Okay, so this is Anaharo, a Huana spirit, a dead explorer, and a Huana spirit. So the only named one is Anaharo here, who is coming for all of us. Nice. Dare holding down the fort over here. That's right. I want Algina to be using her sword. You subdue the furious souls, ripping them into motes of their con constituent essence. Beyond this cloud of essence, you feel the pull of the cycle, a force that steadily increases. This pillar remains steadfastly blocked from the natural flow. Power still hums through the essence. Sending it through the cycle would restore the Adra around you. Fragmenting it would detonate the delicate balance of power, destroying the pillar. Either way, the steady tug of the beyond grows. You must decide quickly. I can restore its luminosity, or I can destroy the pillar. I'm going to restore its luminosity. I know that's what the Valiant Trading Company would want, and I don't necessarily care for them, but I feel like that's the best for the islands around this place as well. You push the essence through the widening channel to the beyond. They churn and spin away. Suddenly, the ether around you develops a churning maelstrom. You pull yourself back toward your body before the force rips your soul away. Looks like a portal just opened up there for us. Uh. Happily. You cling to the tether of your soul, racing to the safety of the material world even as the immaterial one warps around you. Essence floods the newly restored Adra, filling it with a light and heat that is both agonizing and rapturous. You return to your body, feeling as though you've just fallen into it from a mountaintop. Your companions gasp and groan beside you. You cover your face against the light radiating from the restored Audra. Alright, we're out. Let's see what it says here. Uh, now that I know what happened to Pokokohara, Atsura will be interested in my report. I've cleared the corruption from the Audra and the storms in the area. He's not going to be happy about that. Um... And then, what was the other one called? Dim Prospects? Atsuro wanted to know what happened at Pokokara. Alright, and we see here that the Adra has been restored. The Luminous Adra has been restored. It's glowing green once again because the corruption is gone. The Adra Pillar hums with life. Soul energy flows its bright streams down the length of the column. All right, so like I said, Atsara will not be happy with us, but I do think this was the right call, and hopefully it helps Tikawara as well. Time to head back to Tikawara. See if anything's changed over there, and then we should probably go back to Nekataka. got a couple things to do there. We have to talk to Atsura, and we have to let Shodi pray at the Temple of Gaon. Oh, and I hope I don't forget uh, that we have to go try and find, I forget his name, the guy that stole those gloves from the dark cupboard.
Uh, this is the room entrance. Can I actually go back in this way? Yeah, I can. I wonder what that looked like before. I saw what it looked like before, I just don't remember. Oh, how did I miss this? And it looks like all the dust storms that were here are now gone. going to start to attack us, but he did not. Of course. As you near the dock, voices roar over the din of the waves. It seems as if the entire village has gathered, and many of them don't seem happy. I thought that they would be happy. I hope that's not for us. I wonder if they wanted the storms there. They argue with one another, pointing into the distance, but at your approach, they turn to stare at you, their eyes wide with apprehension or anticipation. The crowd parts for the Ranga, whose grin has brought his shoulders. My fishermen saw your boat sailing from Pokokohara. The storms, they parted like a school of fish before Nagati herself. He wipes his brow with the back of his hand. Um, the benevolent response is, you're welcome, but he didn't say thank you. Seems kind of, um, jokey to me or sarcastic, but I'll, I'll, I'll use that one. You're welcome. Now, the Valian Trading Company will send ships, people, and supplies. Tikawawa will be the greatest port east of Nekataka. First, they must clear room for docks and storehouses. But that will be many months from now, No. The dwarf wipes his brow, considering the beach and the half-finished, half-painted huts built along it. The young priestess glares with open malice, the angles of her crossed arms and clenched jaws sharp as daggers. Already they make plans. If that's all, I should be going. I say this is a turn in our fortunes. The first of many. His smile widens further still. You are always welcome among us. Accept this and know our thanks. You've gained an item, exceptional spear. Okay. The others nod and disperse, murmuring to one another as they scatter across the village. So, it seems like some of them are angry because since the storms dissipated, then Valians will come here and start trading with them. But I feel like the fishing will be better now too and they'll be better fed, so... I don't know, I guess they hate the foreigners that much. For what do you linger here? The village is... Nothing new. Uh, Vector was a dwarf who was a part of the Balian expedition that died in uh, Pukakara. Soon the director will send supplies and immenses and soldiers. Unless uh, you have room on your ship. He looks at you, kneading his knuckles. I found the remains of your expedition. That you mean? Madiko. His thick brows rise in alarm. If the expedition failed, the company will hesitate to finance a second one. They might close the book forever. He sighs, scratching his head. You sweat too much over too little, Victor. I have never known the company to hold the expedition's cook responsible <laughs> for its success or failure. Captain Bez always said that the cook is the heart of morale. Can you not imagine why I am high-strung with a crew's fortunes balanced on every dish? If their work was finished, their families in the republics would be compensated. Wants us to do something? I'll see what I can do. Agresima. 
Farewell. I don't know if I want a Valian cook aboard our ship. Um, and then it, we had an option to give him the pages. I don't know if I want to do that. All these Valian people are... Palagina included. They, they seem to act like the Valian Trading Company can do no wrong. Huh. Is there any further republics? Still haven't met with the director. And no, okay. I don't need a cook. And I don't really like Vector. I'm not gonna hire him. Uh, I do want to go see the chieftain, and I want to see uh, the priestess who seemed angry with us. One day soon, this will be a busy port. You have done a great thing for us. See, I can give him bases pages as well. The Valians would have harvested your souls to use machines, to use the machines in Pogokahara. He might hide them. I want people to know what the Valians were doing. Knowing your inclinations about the gods, I'm surprised you didn't give Ruanu a piece of your mind. Ruanu is the Ranga of Chikawara. I cannot risk the company's interest here by offending him. And I suppose he did do enough talking for all of us. All right. The gods give answers. It is only my duty to listen. Okay, so yes, I can give her the pages. You were right to be wary of the Valians. Again, this is nonsense. Beza's notes are her own. Her mad fantasy should not disgrace the company by association. Palagina's eyelids narrow and jaw clench in frustration. She takes the pages and examines them. Her finger crawls down the text. She's reading slowly, but her eyes are widening with understanding and horror. And the Ringa sold us to these sea snakes. She smooths her hands down her long skirt to still their shaking. Thank you for this warning. But for what did you bring this to me? And I'll just say this was the right thing to do. I'm not always a very passionate person, but I think this is the right answer here. Then I thank you. Perhaps it is too late to stop the Valians. But I will do what I can. Very well. Okay. Yeah, if we gave him the Vector, I feel like he would have destroyed them. If we gave them to the Ranga, he probably also would have destroyed them, but the Priestess might actually be able to do something with them. Um, I don't think she's going to go and attack anybody or anything like that, but she can at least have people start to be wary of what the uh, Valians are up to. Palagina's not happy with us. The um, path that we chose for Palagina in the first game was about her kind of going against the company's wishes. She thought that what she was doing would help the company, but because it was against their wishes, they kind of um, ostracized her. But here, and, and she uh, mentioned that at the beginning of the game when we first ran into her. Oh, I want to sell some stuff first. Um, we mentioned She mentioned that at the first part of the game when we ran into her um but she seems well, what do you linger here the... am i a kuaru go see the sweaty one the dwarf she seems much more i don't know the word like manipulated she seems much more like she like the company can do no wrong in her eyes here and she always if anybody says anything negative about the company, then she, then she feels like she needs to speak up and say, "What are you talking about? That's not what the company does." Um, so I don't know. That that seems maybe she's just uh, jaded from what had happened to her when she did what she thought was best for the company, but still got ostracized. So maybe now she is simply a company man, like I've said before, just simply 
wants to do whatever the company needs her to do, and the company can do no wrong, according to her anyway. Soon the director will send supplies and immenses and soldiers, unless uh, you have room on your ship. He looks at you, kneading his knuckles. Um, and just one more thing about Palagina. I guess it does make sense as I was talking through that, her uh, character development from the first game to the second game. But even though it makes sense, it actually makes me like Pelagina less. Right, so let's head back to Nikitaka. I have no idea if we're leaving uh, Tiguara in a better spot or not. Is supply? Yeah, that's just... Maybe we'll get some rum to uh, up their morale a little bit. And before we head out, actually, I'll do this. I think I can do it while we're sailing. Oh, that ship is still there. So I guess when we are in like a local map, time doesn't move. That's what it seems like to me anyway. Uh, so I want to go to Nakataka. Yeah. I don't know what happens if we run into a boat. I don't know if it starts a fight or something. Maybe I should have looked to see. I'll try and do that next time. Save it or something. So first, well, let's see if we can find the director. Then we'll go to the Brass Citadel. Then we'll go to the Sacred Stair. I think maybe um, this guy who stole the gloves is on the docks. So let's head to um, Billion Trading Company first, see if we can find the director. And then we'll go to the docks, see if we can find, I forget his name. Is this someone I know? Calais? And here I thought Tewenu would hold vigil on the company's stoop until the last shard of Audra was dredged up from the ruins of his village. Sometimes it pays to be wrong. What is she talking about? I do not remember what this is. And here I thought Tuwenu would hold vigil on the companies. Oh, he's talking about the um, the Huana that um, got kind of duped into giving away his island uh, to the Valians. Okay. Someone had to step in and help. Plenty of folk disagreed with you, it seems. I wonder, what makes you so different? The Valian Trading Company is so fixated on incremental profits that by the time they make any real headway, Rawatai will own every island in all but name. She shakes her head and sighs. And the Hawana are so gullible that their loyalties will be spread across half a million contracts, and nothing but black powder will remind them who truly owns Deadfire. Yep, Royal Deadfire Company, very militaristic. Stop by the Royal Deadfire District sometime. 
Rawatai needs men and women of action to represent our interests. And I can see a promising career for someone like you. Reaction you take in this game seems to make one of the factions at least happy and one of the factions disappointed in you, um, regardless if that's what you wanted to do or not. Here's the governor's bodyguard. Take a seat. You have business here. I've just come from Port Maje. Governor Clario suggested I might find work here. You are in luck. The governor is between meetings. Go on in. Is this the governor, Luis Alvari? Yes, this is the director. Standing next to her desk and lost in thought, Governor Alvari looks up at your approach. Her expression of intent focus thaws instantly, and she greets you with a startlingly sunny smile. The watcher from the palace, yes. You made quite the impression on the Cantonese. He went on for ages. Welcome. Make yourself comfortable. I am Nueva Alvari, governor in residence of the Valian Trading Company here in Nekataka. What brings you to my door? I did not hope to hear from them again. We have been expecting the expedition's return for some time now. Ah, before you get too far on the way, I think you ought to come with me. Director Castor will want to hear from you in person. Alvari tells me you are kind enough to look into this business on Pococahara for us. I hope you bring good news. A lot of corpses for one viable Audra pillar. I hope it's worth it. A terrible price, to be certain. But at least we have not lost everything. An Adra vein of that size will go some way towards setting us back on our feet. See, that's another thing. I did not do this for them, but they're treating it like I did. Assuming we can replace the people we lost. I notice Beza is not with you. Did you find any sign of the expedition? They died in the ruins at Poco Kohara. The defenses were too much for them. A sorry end for such dedicated individuals. How very fortunate that you lived to tell their tale. I believe I can take things from here, Alvari. Agrasima. The Watcher and I have more business to discuss. Oh, and do pay the man for his trouble first. Alvari wordlessly hands you a coin purse. She bows stiffly, then turns to depart. Got 1700 copper. I thought it best I speak with you face to face. Watchers are not so numerous here in the Deadfire, especially those of such storied backgrounds as yourself. I'd read much about your exploits alongside the Crucible Knights in Defiance Bay. <laughs> Their little experiments. <laughs> uh, just as a reminder, in the first game, uh, we chose to uh, ally with the Knights of the Crucible, who were uh, trying to put together their own Forge Knights, much like the Anamots that the Anguithans used. Uh, they went rogue, and we had to put them down. They had killed several Knights of the Crucible. Um, 
So that's what he's talking about here, those those experiments that the Knights of the Crucible and Defiance Bay in the first game were doing. And I think that we are, each of us, in a position to offer each other something that we cannot find elsewhere. The Valian Trading Company has had a presence on this island for nearly a century now. We have the greatest fleet on the seas, the support of the richest men and women in the world. What can the Royal Deadfire Company offer? A soldier's wages, so that you can elevate the fortunes of a distant king? Once again, setting himself against the Royal Deadfire Company. All these factions only care about taking the other ones down. Um, he also did the corporate thing of, and I think we are each of us in a position to help uh, to offer each other something we cannot find elsewhere. In other words, just like making it seem like we can get something out of this too. It's not just for me. I also care about you, which, yeah, right. He only cares for us as much as we can do things for him. And the queen? A place in the Kahanga tribe among all the rest of these neglected people. You've lived outside the caste system all these years. Are you eager to return to it? I can give you money. Fame, certainly. But the men and women of the company, we set our aims high. And if I only wanted to offer you work as an Adra inspector, I would have let Alvari deal with you. So what is it you want? The Valian Trading Company has maintained an outpost here in Nekataka for nearly a century now. It was only two years ago that we discovered the effects of Luminous Adra with the aid of our Animancers and several Watchers. Flaune Alette has continued to study the potential of Luminous Adra in all manner of advances. Why content ourselves to sell all this Adra as a luxury when we might use it to change the world? But then you've made her acquaintance, haven't you? I urge you to speak with her. They may seem fanciful, but these experiments are of vital importance. I believe he's talking about on the Sacred Stair, that uh, company that was trying to um, figure out how to teleport people. We got a quest for doing that already. Watcher, what can I'll answer what I can, of course. All right, let's answer. Let's uh, ask him some of these questions. Tell me more about the Valian Trading Company. There's a great deal to talk about, and uh, I assume you don't want a history lesson. Was there something specific you wanted to know? How did the company start? It was established in 2708, after the Deadfire's wealth of resources became apparent. The first of the company's directors, Ferrer Batteret, was granted authority to gather those resources in the name of the Valian Republics. There was no Kahanga tribe of note then, really. No Queen Onakaza, to be sure. Our chief competitors at the time were the Adherans. Much as with the Deerwood, the Empire couldn't maintain a foothold. Um... I think he's talking about the Adherans tried to maintain a foothold in both the Deerwood and in the Deadfire and were unable to do so. We didn't discover the properties of Luminous Adra until a couple of years ago, but the company's successes in the region predate that by quite some time. So, in other words, they were here even before they found out how valuable Luminous Adra was. What are the company's interests in the Deadfire? Chiefly Luminous Adra. There are various mining interests among the investors as well, but the Luminous Adra trade has taken priority. But the company has also funded advancements in the field of animancy. The Deadfire holds numerous in Gwithin ruins. And unlike the Deerwoods Glanfathens, the Huana take no great offense if we go digging through the past. So the Glanfathans were the ones that would protect the Ingwithan Ruins, where here, nobody really cares if you plunder the Ingwithan Ruins. How does the Valian Trading Company get along with other groups in Nekataka? You're going to really answer this. Oh, relations with the Huana have been peaceful for the most part. Onakaza's work uniting the tribes has certainly made negotiations more feasible. A few outlying tribes are still openly hostile towards us. 
As for the Royal Deadfire Company, I think it's uh, safe to say we are competitors. Whatever plans they have for the Deadfire, our outposts seem to be in the way. The pity of it is that under friendlier circumstances, we might have appreciated Rawatai's support against the Principi. As it stands, they sink our ships as often as the pirates. Okay. Yes. I have some questions for you. I can, of course. Uh, tell me about the Animancers. Flaune Alette is my main point of contact, to be honest. Apart from a few special appointments, she selected her own assistants. A talented group to a one. I find them painfully young at times. Alette has always been a firebrand. She rubbed a few people the wrong way back in the Republics, which gave me the opportunity to offer her a place here on an island paradise. What's your interest in animancy? Ah, yes. I've never had the best of luck explaining. It's easier to say it's the future and leave it to the imagination. <laughs> Everything the Luminous Adra Power can do, the rejuvenating effects, the energy, is no more than a pleasant side effect for the shareholders. But the truth is, this research could propel us ahead decades. We tangle with the fabric of the soul. Imagine. If we could better ourselves as easily as we mend a battered hull, if we could transport ourselves leagues and leagues away in a moment. It's, uh, it's the potential of the thing. I wish everyone could see it. I'm finding it hard if he is to tell if he is uh, sincere in all of these things that he wants. And he's just kind of parroting Valiant Republic talking points, but he actually believes them? Or is he one of the people that has learned how to talk about things to make them more palatable to people who are listening to you? Uh, what do you make of the Huana? The people? They are pleasant enough. Very welcoming. Superstitious, of course. Ignorant of a lot of what occurs beyond their territory. That said, Nekataka is certainly beautiful, isn't it? Ak, I much prefer to be posted here than some little fishing village. And the queen certainly strikes an impressive figure. There are a great many legends about her. I suspect a few are even true. <laughs> I'd like to know more about you. Me? I, I suppose that's fair. I... I know a great deal about you, after all. I've worked for the company a long time. Before that, uh, I managed a family business. A merchant, you might say. I like to think I have a good eye for talent. Talent and opportunity. That's all any venture needs. I suppose it uh, caught the Songreta Mia Compressa's attention. I was assigned here. You didn't volunteer? Ah, uh, uh, no. The Songretta, it has free reign in such matters. That I was appointed director means that they uh, had faith I would be the most effective choice. He sounds a little doubtful of this. It is an honor one does not refuse. Castel inclines his head, smiling thinly. I see. So nothing too interesting, I'm afraid. Unless you have an interest in Valian law. What can you tell me about Governor Alvari? Alvari? Appointed by the council, that one. Uh, to be honest, I know very little about her. Certainly a competent woman when it comes to uh, short-term goals. There are rumors she started out on a ship, a deckhand if you believe it. Quite the climb from humble beginnings. That's all for now. Now then, was there something you needed? Farewell. Okay, so a little bit of a history there on the Valian Republics and the Valian Trading Company and their presence in the Deadfire Archipelago. Also, uh, Director Castell and what he's doing here. Um, I think we got some new quests here. Oh no, it was just the uh, Animancers at the Sacred Stair. Okay, so this makes me think that even though... 
we didn't do it for the Valian Trading Company, the Royal Deadfire Company is going to be very upset and take it as like a strike against them or something. I wish there was a way to say, I didn't do it for you. I did it because the Luminous Adra is important and it should be working. But alas, that's not an option. All right, so let's head to the docks here, see if we can you find... You certainly seem to admire the luminous bathhouse, Alot. It was made by animances, of course. And if they devoted all their efforts to such endeavors, you wouldn't hear me complain. It is a wonder they manage at all without your wisdom and guidance. Huh. All right, so where is this guy? Oh, that's in the Brass Citadel. I have to go for that. Oops, okay. Which is where I wanted to go anyway. Still looking pretty good in case there's any fights. Quick save in case there's some random encounter. Um, I think we'll go... Imperial Command. I think that's where everybody is. Is this just the bounty guy? Good to see you again. Nope. Not the person we need to see. All right, Hazanui. You look like you've come with a purpose. Uh, nope. I guess it's that's that's Sura down here. to cheat at Hazatoa. Clear skies. What exactly is the Brass Citadel? He hesitates, looking at you as if the answer is obvious. It's a trading post, of course. What do you trade? Rawatai is rich in saltpeter, copper, and a few other profitable minerals. We generally trade for food and timber, which grow poorly in the rough country. So sticking with the idea that uh, Rawatai has a difficult time growing their own food and rather have to trade for it. So that is often what they do here. Um, they have things that are good for military, though, which um, probably does at least part of the explaining why they are such a militaristic operation. Um, the rough country here is an affectionate term. Rawatayan is an affectionate Rawatayan term for their homeland. Rough refers to both the unyielding rocky soils and the storms that batter the mainland. The Valians have become aggressive competitors in recent years, but our ships were plying the seas long before the Republic's declared independence. Um, the Republic's declared independence from, I'm going to guess, Old Valia. Uh, Valia and Adir were the two of the main empires of the world, and both have since kind of fallen into irrelevance. Um, not quite irrelevance, they're still there, um, but Old Valia is, I think, a little bit less substantial than the Adiran Empire, but they have lost their foothold in a lot of different places around the world. Um, and whereas the Valian director was harping on how long they've been in the dead fire and have had an interest in the dead fire and how long they've been here uh been here longer than the royal dead fire company blah 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 this person here is just talking about uh their ships and how they have been um plying the seas as he says since even before 
uh, the Valiant Trading Company existed. So where the Valiant Trading Company is talking about their foothold in the Deadfire Archipelago, the Royal Deadfire Company is talking about the seas in general. Um, so both of them are just kind of harping on their positive sides, what they have a lot to be proud of. And I mean, I guess, obviously, they're not saying like, yeah, we could do better here and there, uh, because a lot of these people, since they're higher ups, just want to um, basically sell how great their uh, allegiance is. We learned the value of defending our goods and ships long ago. Um, all right. I restored the Luminous Audra at Pogo Kahara. That explains the rumors the Valians are scaling up in Queen's birth. I'd hoped you would stop them. His expression doesn't change, but you can feel his dissatisfaction like a shift in the temperature. You got moderate negative reputation with the uh, Royal Deadfire Company. Yeah. See, all of these things is basically, yeah, I'm just going to shrug, be stoic here. Um, the only other thing I might say, the benevolent response is they, uh, they'll bring development and trade that will improve the lives of many. Um, that's not why I did it. Again, I know I've said that before, but I, I don't want to answer that. And then look at how, what they're accomplishing with Animancy. I can't stop progress. That's like I'm enamored with the Valian Trading Company. And now I have the trust. Imagine what I can do with that. The uh, the shady response there. But I'm just going to shrug the stoic response. Nevertheless, I'm more interested in reports the storms around the islands have cleared. What do you know of this? Strong concentrations of essence affect the physical world. That's how blights manifest, for instance. Even if this isn't the outcome we'd wanted for Poco Kahara... Your observation is infinitely more valuable. Take this, and remember it the next time we call on you. He hands you a purse, but his expression is distant, as if he's still thinking about what you told him. And we got moderate, positive reputation, so we kind of broke even there, and we got some money from him. Um, he probably wants to keep being allied with us. He knows that the Watcher of Katnua is an important person, and he doesn't want to completely break ties just after one thing here. We'd long suspected something unnatural was behind the storms, but we had little evidence. The smile playing at his lips is that of a man who's seen the next three moves in a game of Hasatoa. Rawatai's plagued with terrible storms. You think there may be a connection? Yes. If the storms that assail Rawatai have a similarly unnatural origin, then perhaps they too can be stopped. He looks back up to you, his eyes bright with purpose. See, and I'm okay with that. That's talking about his homeland and making it better for the people there, not spreading their fingers out everywhere and taking advantage of other people. And if that's the case, then there's more work to be done, work that you might be able to help with. Another silence passes as he regards you. After all, somebody has to keep the peace in these tumultuous times, no? He smiles, showing you all of his pointed teeth, and that's because I am a be benevolent person that he says that. In any case, Hazanui Karu has a matter that could use your help. Her office is on the main floor behind the large double doors. It's most conspicuous. Very well. All right, so let's go see Hazanui Karu. That's called strategy. And don't you... Atsura tells me you tamed the storms of Poco Kohara. She scratches her chin with the stem of her pipe, watching you with new interest. Makes a person wonder... What kind of secrets lie in Andra's mortar? Ah, she takes a thoughtful puff on her pipe. So Andra's mortar, which people have not been able to sail due to the constant storms around there, that's what they want. We were able to tame the storms around Poco Kahara, so now the 
Royal Dead Fire Company thinks we might be able to do something about the storms around Andra's Mortar. Why do you say that? She grins, smoke curling between her teeth. Don't tell me you've never gazed at a horizon and wondered at what lies beyond. Or seen a no trespassing sign as a challenge. Mischief tugs her smile across her broad jaw. In that moment, she looks somehow younger. Yes, I suppose I have. That's the spirit. She claps you on the back, her wooden hand clapping against your shoulder. Rautai's storms have made us who we are as a nation. Hardy, driven, inventive. But they've also held us back. Forced our people to seek resources and livelihoods far from our homes and families. Imagine how much more we could achieve if we could control those storms. So, again, I mean, I don't doubt that she would want the storms around Rawatai gone. Uh, but she is hiding the actual goal here, which is they want access to Andra's Mortar. You think something in Andra's Mortar will help you with that? Why not? The storms there cannot be natural. Not when they are so ferocious, so constant. She motions to the window. A thin stream of smoke follows her gesture. And your exploits at Poco Kahara suggest that something else may be behind them. But enough of that for now. She waves the smoke between you away. Atsura said you needed my help? There's an understatement. She knocks the bowl of her pipe against her wooden hand. The trouble in Hasango forced us to send additional ships back to Rawatai to make up for shortfalls. <sighs> And storms at home have delayed another portion of our fleet. This leaves us short-handed here. She purses her lips with displeasure. If this is what you call short-handed, I'd love to see what you consider full capacity. I'm sure you'll get the chance. We're due to collect a special shipment for delivery to our port at Sayuka. We've contracted with a captain named Widla. A flicker of distaste passes across her face. Meet her, complete the trade, and take the cargo to Sayuka. Fle Fleet Master Okaya is overseeing the development of some special projects there. Sorry, I almost interrupted her there. She takes a thoughtful draw on her pipe and she looks at you, seemingly deciding what to say. She's one of the brightest minds in Rawatai, and it shows. You two will get along. Her amusement manifests in the barest lift of her eyebrows. Most of her work is, or should be, under wraps for now. But perhaps she can give you a taste of what we have to offer. What's the shipment? It'll be easier for Okaya to explain. She puffs a thick cloud of smoke between the two of you. She doesn't break your gaze, but the effect is almost the same. Widla and her crew, who are they? Good sailors with a fast ship and no mind for questions. She chomps a little harder on the bite of her pipe. My insight allows me to say they're smugglers. Along with half the population of this storm-tossed archipelago. She shakes her head. Why don't you send Whittler's crew to Sayuka? Her laugh sounds like a grunt. Let's just say, I'm not keen to invite them to a port where we're developing experimental technologies. Forget I asked. Any other questions? If it's important, I can handle it. What next? Whitler's agreed to meet our courier out at sea, away from the heaviest traffic. She gestures on her map to the open water west of Nakataka. This is her payment. We've already negotiated with her. She hands you a purse of a thousand copper. Fleet Master Okaya will see to your compensation once you arrive with the cargo. She watches you appraisingly. Deadfire makes crooks and thieves out of the best of us. Somehow, though, you've stayed above all that. I'm hoping this means I can count on you. It's because I'm honest that she says that. Clear skies. Calm seas. All right, now let's go see if we can find uh, this thief.
as a Bertena. Beat it. I don't have time to chit chat. Finn Balian glances over your shoulder with an expectant frown. I'm in the market for some gloves. Have any? He eases back, taking your measure with a critical eye. Fasina sent you, didn't she? Bostinago, just for these. Shaking his head, he pulls a pair of fine gloves from his pocket, studying them with evident disappointment. Soft as down, but not a single fence willing to pay me a fair price. Maybe they've got imp stink all over them. You're going to have a hard time selling an archmage's glove for fast coin. Should have guessed these were bad luck. Well, it's too late to go making smart decisions, isn't it? He opens his mouth to say more, but something to the southwest distracts him, as his expression fills with dread. Here he comes, and I'm too late. If Hamuto doesn't give me an extension on my debt, I'm a dead man. Keep your mouth shut and follow my lead. Glancing at you, Bertano shrugs and swallows down a lump in his throat. Man, if he's hiring, if he's hiding from the Royal Deadfire Company, why would he come to the Brass Citadel? A unit of steely-eyed sailors approach the docks, clutching pikes and firearms with quiet professionalism. At their head stands a tall Amao in a mustard yellow uniform. He turns his attention between you and Berteno. So, Berteno, you hired a mercenary, or else a negotiator. That coin should have gone toward your debt to me. Hamuto rubs a long scar that extends the length of his neck. This is someone called Hamuto Stoneheel. Huh? No, I didn't. Uh, that is, uh, I would never go behind your back. I... Bertano's voice falters, and he turns to you with sudden panic. I almost accidentally clicked the attack button. Say nothing. A silent mercenary at that. This is a private matter. Your interference is unnecessary. Hamuto spreads his hands in a peaceful manner as his soldiers level their guns at Bertano. What's your plan for Bertano? Indentured servitude. I trust this is a more honest and respectable alternative than any pursuit he would take on his own terms. Perhaps I can pay what's owed? You must care a great deal for this insufferable little worm to stake your purse on his freedom. Hamuto taps his lower lip in thought. Four hundred pyres are what Berteno owes. When I will accept that sum to have this sorry business concluded. Four hundred is nothing. I'll give it to him. Payment is agreed. Then our business is concluded. Hamuto signals his men to stand down. After a hateful look, they lower their arms and follow their captain's lead. I can't believe I'm finally out of debt. I got minor positive reputation there with the Principe. Were those Principe? They look, I thought they were Royal Deadfire Company. There's Bertano Principe. For the first time in my life, I'm free. Bertano clasps his hands together, tears bringing, brimming in the corner of his eyes. Say nothing. If you see Fasina, tell her I'm hiding out with some Principi friends. Also, catch! He tosses you Rokoa's fingers with casual disdain. These are Rokoa's fingers. They give you plus one dexterity and plus one sleight of hand. And Spark Crackers produces a dazzling swarm of colorful bursts, startling and confusing everyone in the affected area. Hailing from the slums of Nekataka, the master pickpocket Rokoa made her humble fortune by cutting purse strings and picking pockets. Her talent for liberating wealth from those who seemed so incapable of keeping it was due in part to these enchanted gloves. When warm, they seem hardly there, like a second skin. When dipped into a pocket or satchel, one's fingertips practically filch on their own accord. Okay. So we got those. It's a new Berteno all the way. Pirate Berteno doesn't get himself in anyone's debt. Laughing in a full voice, he makes a hasty exit. Eh, we'll see. Guy doesn't seem like the smartest. Alright, 
Now to the sacred stairs to let Shoti pray. So you're the commander Here's of the where I do the ritual. Iron Flail? Right there, Will under the statue of God. Rubbing the back of her neck self-consciously, Shodi casts her gaze to the side. <sighs> Nothing like a homecoming to make a girl remember her roots, even if they are dried up and half dead. She sighs, nudging a bit of mud from her boots before she lifts her face to settle on you with her big, dark brown eyes. Adair heaves a sigh. Sometimes I wonder if my brethren don't think I got black ichor running in my veins. People often fear what they don't understand. Suppose they do. Suppose sometimes people do bad things in the name of their gods. But my brethren do more good than bad. And more good than most. Besides, I often don't understand you, Watcher. But I ain't afraid of you. She ducks her head to hide her smile, but her eyes never leave your face. They glint with a mischievousness. That's reassuring. Is it? <laughs> Sakes alive. Her cheeks flush brightly. I feel like this game pushes you a little bit too hard into romantic things. You shouldn't be so fine to me, Watcher. It makes me think untoward things. Gives me notions I don't need to be getting. I can't risk straying when I got a duty to gone. Uh, speaking of gone. Yeah. She can't her head to the side. Lay it on me. We came here to cleanse your soul. All right. Yeah, I'm ready. I've done this before, but never with such a full lantern. You may want to stand back. The uh, experience can be somewhat intense. Kneeling before the statue of Gon, Shodi set her lantern between her sets her lantern between her knees, head bowed. She presses both palms to the copper cage. A low chant lilts from her lips. As it grows louder, the light from her lantern glows brighter, as does the lantern that the statue of Gon holds in one skeletal hand. The, lights, the two lights pulse in rhythm with chant, resonating with each other. Twin heartbeats that pound faster and stronger until the light from Gon's lantern burst toward a shower of violet-hued rays. The essence bathes Shoti's bent form, making her jolt upright as a cry escapes her. <sighs> Don't know if I feel cleaner, but I feel something. Blessed, for sure. Shoti offers you a half-smile as she retrieves her lantern, trembling fingers curling against the gleaming metal cage. Let's just hope it lasts, because my lantern feels as heavy as ever, full to brimming with essence, like dark water spilling over my mind. The Dawn Stars are about goodness and light. Why are you so concerned with, de concerned with death and darkness? Why do you think the God of Rebirth held an aspect of death within him? You can't have life without dying. There ain't no beginning without a prior ending. Ain't no day without night. No spring without fall. You can't grow crops if you never harvest for seeds. Remind me again the difference between Gone and Aethys. I feel like I've asked these questions before, so I'll just say let's be off. All right. I'll be right behind you. Okay. Shodi is unsure if the cleansing can alleviate her nightmares long term, but she seemed to feel a little better after the ritual. In the meantime, she'd like to continue her mission by gathering more souls. Okay. Where to next? Maybe 
This one says we should be able to do it. So let's, uh, since we're in Sacred Stair, let's go to the Animancers here. Candles and bombs. Supplies, get your supplies here. Could I have here. a moment of your time? Of course. I know someone who works in this tower. An animancer named Giocolo. I'd like to see him if we could. I don't see why not. Agressima. It should not take long. I have not seen him in many years and I wanted to thank him. You feeling all right, Pelagina? You sure you don't mean yell at him? <laughs> when I was a girl, he visited me in the academy. He was studying godlike. Studying what was in our souls that made us different from other kith. He found something in me. Something that resonated like a chime when he held an instrument near me. He said it was like this for all godlike. Different chimes resonating for different types. Tap your chest sounds familiar. I have the Barak ch the Barath chime. But you are not godlike. She narrows her eyes and twists her lips as she considers your meaning. It's something Barath gave me when I was in the beyond. She scrutinizes you, trying to determine your meaning. After a pause, she nods and continues. In any case, he told me it was what was causing my body to change. I begged him to remove it. He refused at first, saying it was impossible. When I told him I would kill myself if he didn't, he said he would try. No one should ever be driven to that. Least of all, a little girl. For once, Shodi looks contrite. Rubbing at the back of her neck, she frowns. I don't expect you to understand, but I was twelve. My body was changing in many ways. Being the only girl, the only godlike girl at the academy was unbearable. You don't have to justify anything to me, Palagina. Agrasima. She smiles warmly at you. Giacolo was not able to remove the chime, but he was able to sever it. When it happened, I blacked out. I did not wake for two weeks. The Brotherhood ejected him from the Academy for ruining their pet godlike. They assumed I would die. I did not. Over time, I lost most of my feathers. The shape of my nose changed. It was not enough to make me fully Galbandra, but it was enough to keep me from wanting to die. So at some point she was had much more feathers than she does now. When I looked in a mirror, what I saw was not a godlike. Not something to be paraded around. It was me. Finally me. I'm glad someone was able to help you. She smiles warmly and breathes deeply. Jacolo saved me. Without his help, I would be dead now. Thank you for understanding. If we can speak to him for a moment in the tower, I would be grateful. All right, so we got Palagino's quest now, a man of chimes. Okay, just one skull there. Um. I also wanted to see if we could grade some people's weapons. Subcharged so field. The pistol creates a zone charged with electro energy. Any enemy or ally. I don't use her gun that much though, so let's not do that yet. This is fine. I can make her 
Armor exceptional, though. I'm gonna do that. And there. Can make his armor exceptional, too. And those are the two people that actually... Yeah, those are the two people that get hit a lot. Okay. Rock solid. Gives me minus 10% crush damage taken. Veteran scars, minus 10 slash damage. So it's either or here. Let's do rock solid. Okay. Shippy's got the, uh, wonder how much, I've only done 19 burn damage out of 250 so far. That's okay, keep going. Nope. Can't upgrade his to exceptional. I can make his scepter fine though. I think I want to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Onward. Oh, I have to ask them about Jacolo. Okay. So I'm going to talk to Flaunoletta. Come to watch us work? It's not as exciting when we're running through calculations. We're looking for an animancer named Jacolo. Jacolo? Ah, I know him. He has a little laboratory for himself down in the gullet. His speciality is godlike. Claims he can detect them in the womb. She spreads her hands theatrically, though her expression never changes. Jacolo rents a room in Ecosi, the hole, which is that grimy tavern down below. Why he seeks to bury himself, you will have to ask him yourself. Not many animancers down there, so he should be easy to find if they haven't stolen all his equipment. Oreto Gori. Oreto Gori is a valiant phrase meaning good luck. Literally, it translates into golden wishes. What can I do for you? So about this experiment. Settled your nerves? All right, let's do this. Sorry. All right, let's do this. Gilardi. Very well. You stand there. Ansel, the machine. All right, Watcher. Remember, focus on the beam of light. It ought to be like stepping through a door. We've already seen this happen at the ruins in Pokokahara this teleportation thing here. And remember, don't... Can't say this is what I imagined hell would look like. So she thinks we're in the beyond, and our quest is to find a way back to the physical realm. Let's see what it says here. Something went very wrong with the experiment. I've appeared somewhere in the beyond. This place seems cold. There is some bodies here that have, I don't know if they are statues or if they're dust. Spirit residue, faint ethereal wisps of soul energy made manifest. I wonder if this is the exact same thing as soul essence in the first game, but it's now called spirit residue. This is why I safeguard the souls in my lantern. Traversing hell ain't always as easy as it ought to be. With every moment, I forget. Oh, merciful gods. That was after I 
took the spirit essence, or what is it called? The spirit residue from the body that was over there. this scourging blight let's see it's probably just the same entry as blights but let's see Not a entry here. Hmm. Okay. Happily, Akira. A wave the size of a mountain. Run. We have to go. Can't. Can't. No. No. Please. These people that are trapped here like we are? Oh man. I wonder if we could have saved that guy. Chunks of unnatural architecture have been torn from the roots hanging still in the void. I conquered every city of the Grey Lands. They will remember my name. Eesh. An end at last. Alright, what is this thing? A soul collector. I beg you. So I think I can do things to him. Cipher things, I mean, attack his mind. This is futile. That soul blight was over there for that long. So we got 17 spirit residues and primal flame. This bright little flame leaps and sparks with magical energy. Sure thing. Flickering motes of energy stream toward the vortex in an unending march. Spirit residue. She te kasi bizu, ye ked tigewu tikiki. Said tikiki is supposed to be yikiki. But either way, I don't know what it means. Ooh, someone up here too. Of course. Of all my people, I am the last. I cannot die here. The beast. The beast. Remergand, maybe? That would make sense. 
of winter. Beast of winter. That's Remagond. The beast. Indeed. A wall formed from tessellating blocks of bismuth rises before you, and from out of that wall juts a face at least three Elmawa high. Its mouth hangs open in a silent shout, eyes wide. A damp, frigid wind screams between the rocks. It carries whispers in its wake and chills you to your core. What have we here? The voice of Remergond rumbles from the stone. Remergond is the god of entropy, cold, winter, bad luck, famine, and natural disasters. Manifests as a giant albino aurochs, moving amidst a great blizzard, and in the plodding footsteps of Remergond come death and disintegration. A wayward watcher has wandered into my realm. Whatever should I do with you? <laughs> the god chuckles, a sound like boulders crashing down a mountainside. You did not receive an invitation to my realm, Herald of Barath. Tell me, why should I not grind your soul to dust? The stone face splits into a broad smile. Hmm. I don't want to join a pact with Remergond. I'm just going to say nothing. Embrace oblivion with open arms. Watcher. The chill wind you first felt when you entered this place picks up. It begins a deafening cacophony, a shriek so loud and sharp it might tear the very bones from your skin, or shred your soul to cobweb tatters. Say nothing. As much as it would delight me to scatter your soul, you belong to Barath. I will spare you that fate. For now. I'm gonna continue to say nothing. Now, on to the matter that brought you here. Your Anamansa friends meddle in things beyond their comprehension. Were I not the generous creature I am, you would have died. Be sure to tell the Anamansas that they have failed. And that they have drawn my gaze. I will not hesitate to obliterate them if they irritate me again. Say nothing? You might prepare yourself, Watcher. For something wondrous is on the horizon. Aeothas will usher in an age glorious in its brevity. So Remergond wants Aethys to continue doing what he's doing? What does that mean? You will soon learn. In the meantime, enjoy the world as you know it while you can. And do send my regards to your Anamansa friends. Remergond's voice fades to nothing. Only the wind remains. Stray again if you just keep me away from Reamer God. So this is Reamer God's domain here. The stone face is silent, though you cannot shake the feeling of being watched. It's Reamer God's domain, domain, and he spared us. Glad he didn't scare us, though. We didn't promise to do anything for him just because he was going to kill us. We just st stood our ground. So I'm proud of us there. Um, let me see here. Uh, I don't want Shodi. I want, oh, here we go. So I am fully benevolent. Almost fully honest. Halfway in stoic, halfway in rational. And a tiny bit clever. Watcher, can you hear me? You raise your head to find yourself surrounded by anxious faces. 
Flauna withdraws the finger, currently prodding at your temple, and nearly stumbles backwards. Oh, thank the gods. Thank, Helia. Merla, you had us in a panic. Flauna sets her hand to her chest and fans herself with the other. I don't have to tell you it didn't work. The current spiked and you went completely still, breathing but nothing else. We sent for the physician. Myself, I was about to try throwing some water in your face. What happened? Did you feel any pain? Do you remember anything? I think I ended up in the beyond. Flauna raises a brow, but the other Animancers look at you with undisguised curiosity, even awe. What was it like? Cold. Weird. While you speak, one of the researchers prods you gently with a copper rod. You hear the device in his hand give a high, piercing whine. Slap the rod away. The device clatters to the ground. The Animancer looks at it, then back at you. Are you feeling any heightened aggression? <laughs> Let's not harass our very patient friend any further. Flauna coughs under her breath. Sienteri, watcher, truly. It seemed we sent your mind further afield than intended, and without the rest of you in tow. Not entirely outside our predictions, but not the result we wanted. We have stipend for volunteers. You're welcome to the sum of it. I hope it goes some way toward earning your forgiveness. Just as I hope this hasn't put you off helping us, we just have to adjust the current, give you a chance to control your... flight, for want of a better word. We're all very glad you're in one piece. We'll have a look at the machines, figure out what went wrong. Until then, I'm sure our friends at headquarters will want an update, and to see I haven't done you any permanent harm. We'll send word when we're ready here. Alright, so I leveled up. There was no opportunity there to tell her to stop doing this. Hope you're keeping busy, Watcher. We're still running some small tests. Not quite ready for the real thing. What can I do for you? Can I ask you some questions? Sure thing, Amiko. Comes with the job, doesn't it? Animancers aren't very popular in the Deerwood. Do the Juana give you any trouble? Oh, things are much different here. The Juana may not have the same passion for the field as the Republic's, but we understand we're doing research, not sacrificing children to wolves or whatever it is the Deerwood believes. So, no riots. Fortunately, news out of the Deerwood doesn't mean much to this lot. Lana winks to undercut her teasing. Your accent. It doesn't sound very Valian. That's weird. I was going to say that. Um, I just thought it was just the voice actor or something, but that's interesting that uh, I can actually point that out. Well, a few years in a deer will do that to you. Up to your armpits in jungle mud, insects, and snotty novels. <laughs> Which is why we stay indoors and take up civilized habits. Like proper enunciation. Shut up, Aloth. Jesus. <laughs> uh, seems like a strange place to run experiments. It took us a few months to adapt. A few bad shocks, too, before we finished proofing the machinery against rain. I like to think it lends it all a little drama, no? Besides, how better to honor Helia than with invention? Pelagina tries to muster a weak smile, but gets contorted into annoyed grimace along the way. That was all. For now, eh? No trouble if you think of anything else, amigo. I'll be on my way. Alright, so leveled up. Once again, I'm going to uh, level up on camera, and I'll just put a timestamp on screen if you want to skip ahead. Alright, so Pelagina first. Keep her going with Arcana and Diplomacy. Um, and choose an ability for one class. Oh, okay, so I only get one here. Um, did Chanter last time, so let's do a Paladin this time. burn damage to eternal devotion on her sword. I dare. Athletics and survival. Okay, so I have some stances here. I think I want to 
be kind of a tank with him, so I'm going to give him the Guardian Stance. Enemies that disengage from the fighter are immediately attacked and proned if successful. Is that the right one, or is it... How come he gets two, but Palagina didn't? How did that happen? Um, okay, Conqueror Stance. When hurt or above, the fighter's accuracy bonus increases. Mob Stance. Each nearby enemy reduces the fighter's recovering time between attacks. Let's see what else I can do. Yeah, I'm going to give him Uncanny Luck. Small chance to completely avoid any attack and convert some hits to critical hits. And then I will give him Toughness to increase my max health that I gain with each level. Um... Maybe I just didn't get it there. Okay. Mechanics and insight for Biarter. I can choose two here. So I can improve my backlash. Yeah, I'm going to do that and give him the toughness so that he gains more health. So wait, Brutal Backlash involves retali invokes retaliatory strikes, stunning an enemy whenever they target the Cypher's will defense, and this one... Um, no, you know, I'm not going to do that. I am going to instead begin combat with additional focus. Jody, Arcana, and Religion. Uh, I'm going to increase the effectiveness of healing. And then I'm going to reduce the time it takes to complete a spell's cast, rapid casting. I also gained Wicked Briars. And finally, Allah. Explosives. Metaphysics. Maybe I'll give him rapid casting too. I don't like spells that target everybody in there, just in case one of my allies wanders into the area. Sitzel's Spirit Lance creates a pike of pure magical force that deals pierce damage and causes a full only blast explosion when striking. That sounds interesting. Causes enemies in the area of effect to envision their worst fears, afflicting them with weakened and terrified. I like that. That is uh, Ringrim's enervating, enervating terror. All right, so let's just go report to the Valiant Trading Company, and then we'll call it a session.
I thought that would um, be a little bit longer there. But maybe I was just remembering the second part of it or something. Because it seems like maybe we can try to do that again at some point. Can't believe Olivia found another volunteer. Oh, that's a... Supplies! <laughs> get your supplies here! What? That's really the long way around there. Uh, really quickly, I'm going to save in case we have some random encounter. And then I want to go to... Let's go to Queen's Birth. So it's night, so let's go take a rest in the Wild Mare before we go to the Valian Trading Company. I do for you. You see anything you like? I will take the private dance room again. Plus one cast with level one spells and plus one all skills. Adrift in dreams, Shodi lies curled on her side, sweating, muscles quivering. She whimpers low in her throat. Watch her sleep. Her chest rises and falls faster and deeper until she's very nearly heaving. Suddenly, she jolts upright, eyes wide and terrified. She chokes back a shriek. She calms, confused eyes searching your face. Reckon that's the first time I ever bore witness to my own demise. It was not pretty. She worries her bottom lip with her teeth. Never woke with such a driving need for reaping before. It's making my hands shake. Didn't the cleansing work? It did for a while, but then it wore off. All this essence I've gathered. It soaked the blessing right up. Left me with hardly none. You're losing your light to the darkness. Rekindle it by helping the living. She sucks in a deep breath. You sound like my high priestess, Samhain. She never shuts up about the living, when she ought to worry more about the dead. Seems the more souls I gather, the better I see Gon's will, and the less I get a wink of sleep. Your nightmares are getting worse. Night or day, sleep or waking. It's getting harder to tell what's real from what's just yet to come. There is something I'm meant to do, though. Once I gather enough souls, us Gonites, we're supposed to shepherd lost souls, not just gather them. The harvesting's only the first part. If I were to dump the souls, it might make me dream less, like before. Or, darn it, who knows? Maybe it'd just make it all worse. Either way, I've got to find my purpose. She turns her face away, bottom lip trembling. Slowly, her fingers reach for the hem of your shirt. She rubs the pads of her fingers over it, holding, t holding to you this lightest of touches. Will you help me, Watcher? Yes. I was hoping you might would. Sometimes I feel like, with you by my side, I can stand against gods. We'll find an Audravain and release your burden. It's the best way to ensure the souls reach the beyond. You'll need to be a potent source to overpower the draw of my lantern. It's gotta be luminous for sure. She nods, clearly devising a plan of action. That's one problem solved. But what about the itty bitty issue regarding the god of rebirth not actually being in hell? The souls will make it safely, but who's to see to their proper reseeding? 
This is a huge risk of Aeora's balance. You really trust Malgrin not to rebirth Aethasians as warriors of the flame? Think Galloway won't be greedy? Gone aside, the gods' past actions don't instill me with the greatest confidence. Yeah, me neither, Shodi. What else would you propose? Normally, I'd simply safe keep them until the god of rebirth could return to hell. But... I'm gonna say nothing. Maybe she's about to say something. You're right. I ought to deliver as many souls to hell as I can before it's too late. We need to empty my lantern right away. Gods, but you're clever. This is why Gon directed me into your path. I just know it. She nods once before turning away. All right, so looks like we have a new part of her quest. So I need to go to a luminous Audra pillar. All right, well, I'll figure that out next time. Right now, I'm going to go back to uh, the Alien Trading Company. Let's call it a session. Hey, Palagina. I know you're kind. You can't have children. But would you have wanted them? Ah. Uh. It is because I cannot give my country children that I give them so much of the life I have. When I was younger, I took it for granted I'd have them one day. <laughs> Free labor. But a lot of time passed before I knew it. Hardly gave it a thought until now. You are not getting any younger. I know you do not like thinking, Adair. But maybe it's time to start. <laughs> Governor's office. The director's office. That's the governor. It gets upstairs. of course. Was the experiment a success? I helped Flown with her experiment at the Spire. A very dramatic first attempt, I hear. Though, uh, Alette has a tendency to gloss over details. But, uh, I want to hear it from you. My soul was sent... Sorry. My soul was sent to the beyond, into one of Remagon's realms. You'll put the priest into a frenzy with talk like that. Communion with the gods is their business. Despite the levity in his voice, Castol regards you with gloomy regret. A near-death experience does little to recommend Alette's efforts. I am glad you are in one piece, Watcher. We are in the early days of Alette's research. Flawed as this outing was, there is promise there. This is only the start, you know. The very dawn of a new age of discovery. But just imagine... Castel spreads his hands. His eyes behind his spectacles are fever bright with enthusiasm. Imagine if we could transport goods and people more quickly than any vessel or horse. Cure every kind of ailment. Perhaps cure disease altogether. We'll extend our lifespans by decades, maybe even centuries one day. Nothing all those things sound as good as you think they sound, Director. This has all been the work of a single outpost. I want there to be a dozen outposts, a hundred. Animancers working together to better our lives. Look at what we have left behind. Old Velia is a battlefield at constant war with itself. But the Republics have risen from that past. We can rise farther still. And in doing so, we will raise all of Aora with us. 
Who's this speech for? Belfeto. Palgian. Oh, maybe for Palgian. <laughs> Palgina's outburst is restricted front to a single word, but her gaze riveted to the director. For a moment, you even see blue flame of zeal flickering in the depths of her soul. Lofty goals, Castle. Yes, but achievable, I think. I may not live to see it, but I will see the groundwork done. But uh, I've said enough. Too much, I think. There will be more experiments to come. Until then... I have a more grounded task I need assistance with. Nothing that should put your spirit in any danger. <laughs> Nekataka sees its share of smuggling. I doubt that would surprise anyone. But we've learned of our particular exchange that will have more dire effects than a few spoiled Hawana peasants. There is a Royal Deadfire Company official by the name of Quarno, who has been meeting in secret with one of the Principi. I do not believe he works with the approval of his masters. He meets with a Captain Tola, a known pirate and smuggler. I hope I don't have to tell you that an alliance between a crooked royal official and the Principi is not the kind of trouble any of us need. I have a woman, Britza, waiting in the luminous bathhouse in Periki's Overlook. The smugglers do business there, and she has kept an eye on things. I promise to send assistance. Find her, and she will tell you what she knows. Why not just tell the Royal Deadfire Company? It may surprise you, but the Royal Spymaster and I are not on very good speaking terms. I prefer to handle these matters internally. You provide a good opportunity. Ask some questions first. Of course. Best to go in prepared. Why help the Royal Deadfire Company? The discipline of the royal officers isn't really what any of this is about. I'm more concerned about the pirates. In this particular case, the companies share an enemy. Can you tell me more about Britza? A fine, valiant woman. Steady temperament. Good sense. The bathhouse sees an enormous number of patrons every day. It is a useful place to have a set of eyes and ears on hand. Do you know anything else about these smugglers? Only that Tola is a captain of middling repute and some small ambition. I expect she feels that a partnership with Quarna will give her an edge. Britza will know more. Uh, before I had options to say like, yeah, I'll do it if I can, or just I don't want to do it. But now my only option is I'll do it. So I guess I have to take that. Excellent. Meeting you has been a stroke of luck, Watcher. I'll await your report. Okay. So, we had no option there to tell them to stop trying to teleport things. Maybe it's because we need to do the second part of the quest, or maybe further parts of the quest before we can actually do that. Although I would have liked to say, what is wrong with you guys? Can you please stop doing this? Um, to the Animancers and to the Valiants, but... Oh well. We'll have to wait for later for that. Uh, but that will be it for today. Um, we, wow, we did a lot this time, huh? We um, restored the luminosity to the Audra Pillar in Pogokara. Um, and even though that was against the Royal Deadfire Company's wishes, they actually saw some use in what we did um, in getting rid of the storms. The Valian Trading Company right now is very happy with us. Um, so we'll have to see if we can do something about that later. And... That's about it, and uh, we uh, um, forwarded Shodi's quest a little bit more, so um, we'll have to see uh, next time about uh, going to Luminous Audra so that she can get rid of some of the souls that she has with her and return them to the wheel. But that'll have to wait for next time, because it's over for this time. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Please let me know if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, clarifications, those kinds of things, and I hope to see you next time for more sentences and paragraphs. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye.